Hi, <clears throat> welcome to um, lovely Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, this is Event Streams Development with Kafka Streams. Um, so first, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Bill Bijak. Uh, I am on the integration. I'm an integration architect on the DevX team. Uh, prior to that, I spent three years as a software engineer on the Kafka Streams team. I'm an Apache Kafka committer and author of Kafka Streams in Action, and I actually have a second edition of that underway. Um, so what are we going to cover today? Uh, basically, what is an event stream? And then we're going to do uh, a, an overview of what Kafka is, and then we're going to talk about uh, Kafka Streams concepts and architectures, uh, Kafka Streams API and features, and we're going to see an example of an event stream processing before and after. Kafka Streams. So what makes what makes up an event stream? Uh, my answer to that is pretty straightforward. Everything. Everything is an event stream. You have sales, you have an invoice, uh, a trade, customer experience. Uh, and then you can also have a software to software events. So everything that that occurs at a certain point in time, we're going to consider an event, which leads me to all your data are event streams. And so this is important because uh, you know, like to think of, I like to think of Kafka as the central nervous system for your data. So it's going to, it's going to collect data that you're going to send in records coming to Kafka, but you need to process it somehow. So let's take a quick look, but the, these event streams might mean different things to different people. So as an example, let's consider the humble page view event. Now, let's just consider, let's just say for this example, it is a, a banking example. It's a, a, you go to your, your bank, your main website, and then you see a, a, a certain page comes up uh, and you click on it, click through. Uh, you're going to have the session ID, timestamp, uh, what type it is. It's, it's an equity loan offer you clicked on or an advertisement for that. It's got an offer ID, cut your customer ID. So basically, lots of metadata. But this page event means different things to different, different people. Um, you've got, you know, several other people taking a look at it. Uh, underwriting might be, underwriting might be interested in this as a pre-qualification. You clicked on it. Since you're a customer, they're going to look up real quick and run some fast numbers and maybe send a follow-up email uh, asking you about that. Um, data science might be interested in uh, people that looked at this loan offer, offer ended up doing something else. This was their next steps. And then the de promotion department uh, is going to be interested in this as well uh, from the standpoint of are we hitting the right, you know, are the right people clicking on this, the right demographics, you know, or are people seeing it, are they clicking on it? So what this, what this means is since you have uh, this simple page view event and different people, you need a way to, to process this data differently, to process, you know, each one of the, if we consider each one of these boxes were part of separate departments that want to analyze this data, you want them to be able to process it and handle it in the way that makes the best sense for them. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my uh, overview of Kafka. This will be a, a quick one. Uh, Kafka is essentially, it's based on the idea of a log and not the application logs that uh, developers are used to when you're reading the state of your application or the series of events that are happening in the application itself. Now the log is, uh, is there, it, it is the record of transaction. It's the core entity or the core data structure that holds all the series of events that have happened. And each record that comes in just gets appended to the end of the log. It's a very simple data structure. A new record comes in and gets appended. Uh, it's assigned 
a number where it is in the log, which is considered um, an offset number and just keeps going and, and goes to the end of the log. And the nice thing is about this is you get automatically get time ordering of events. And this also, again, this represents, if you want to replay this, this represents the source of truth of data for how things have occurred up to a certain point in time. So what makes up a record in Kafka? So basically you have a header, which can have uh, different types of metadata, and you have a key and a value. Now the key does not have to be populated. A like key could be null. So most likely you're going to have a, a you're always going to have a value. Uh, there's a little difference there with the compacted topics, but that's for another discussion. But one of the other things that's part of a Kafka record, which is important, we'll talk about this later with Kafka streams, is the concept of time. Um, you have event time and log append time. Uh, the producer, when you create a producer record, you have the opportunity to set a timestamp yourself. If you don't, the Kafka producer will set the timestamp, and that is considered event time. Now, there's a configuration you can, the default is event time. There is a configuration you can set where the broker itself will set the timestamp. And that's considered log append time. So what happens there is the broker will overwrite whatever timestamp was put on the Kafka record. The broker will override that and set the timestamp at time it's appending it to the log. Now, a key distinction I want to make here is when you, the record you have itself over here, you can have a timestamp embedded in that. Uh, that could be, you know, let's say you were ingesting records. There's a lag between when the events actually happen and when you get them to produ the producer. So when I talk about setting timestamps, this is on the Kafka record itself. Not This doesn't touch any timestamps you might have in your value. So the next concept I want to talk about in Kafka is the idea of partitions. Uh, Kafka uses partitions uh, for throughput and to distribute the load. Uh, every topic is a topic. You could, every topic has to have partitions, even if it's just when you create a topic, you have to specify the number of partitions, which could be just one. So in that case, it, you have a topic partition where the partition is zero. Uh, we're going to consider this simple case here. You've got three partitions. Uh, so every record comes in, and it's going to, based on the key, it's going to go to a certain partition. And this increases, this, again, this is done for throughput. It also helps spread the load because every broker is in a Kafka cluster. A, topic a broker is considered the lead broker for a topic partition. So this allows, uh, and then the other, like assuming a three broker cluster, uh, you would have a, a broker that's a lead for a topic partition and the other two would be followers. So that helps spread out the load. So you don't have all topic partitions on a particular broker that helps spread it out. And then the, the way the assignment per partition works, if you have a key, it's the standard hash of the key, um, modulo the number of partitions and that determines uh, the, determines the partition to send that put that record on. Uh, if you don't provide a key, there's a new strategy. I think it was in Kafka 2.4. It is the sticky partitioner. It used to be in this case here, uh, or each record that came in, it would be assigned to this partition, and then the next one, and the next one. As the records go into a producer, it, what doesn't producers don't send records automatically. They buffer them up and send them in a batch. So the way, what, what happened here is each record would come in, get assigned partition zero, then the next one partition one and partition two, start back at zero. Now what happens is when records come in, they go, they're assigned to a partition per batch. So what would happen here is you get a batch of records come in, they would first, that first batch would go just to this partition. Then your second batch goes to this the second partition, and then the third batch goes to uh, this partition, and then that starts over again. So you still get a balance of records across partitions, but it's more eventual. It's it's instead of instead of and the advantage to this is 
uh, your for a, a batch, you would only send one batch per part. You're only going to send one batch as opposed to sending multiple batches for partitions. Now, I had mentioned uh, Kafka being uh, assigned a, a being the lead for a topic partition, but also assuming a three broker cluster here. It's also going to have two followers, and this is if you set your replication factor to three. And this is your first, this broker right here is your first, is considered the first replica. These two over here are replicas two and three. So what happens is all interactions for this topic partition presented here go through the lead broker. And you, pr you produce, it goes to this broker, you consume those consumer requests go to this broker. But the two followers are going to continually send fetch requests. And under normal circumstances, they'll be in sync. So at any time, point in time, again, under normal circumstances, you'll have three copies of your data uh, with this configured, with, you know, consider configured for three uh, replicas. So now let's talk about clients. How does the data get into Kafka? Well, you have producers. I've mentioned that before. Uh, just a few seconds ago. You have a producer, you create a producer record and you call producer.send. Now that is an asynchronous call. Uh, and so that allows you to not have to block to wait for the for, for those calls to be successful. And again, when you call producer.send, when you put a record on there, it doesn't send it right away. They go into a buffer and then when they, either when the buffer is full or it's it's considered time to send, then a batch is sent. And again, it will go to uh, a batch goes to one partition and then the next case it would go to a, the second partition. But on the other side of the coin, you have consumers. And what we have here, we've got two partitions and we've got two consumers, but I've got this, uh, Kafka has a notion of a consumer group. And what that is, is both of these consumers uh, are part of group A. So logically what this looks like is one, it's logically one consumer. There's multiple consumers and you can have as many consumers as are topic partitions. You can allocate more, but those will be idle. Uh, maybe for failover reasons, you might have more that are, that are there. <clears throat> but again, so we have, we've got two consumers. Each one is assigned a topic partition. So what happens in the event of a failure? What happens if a consumer is uh, unresponsive? Group coordinator is going to kick this consumer out of the group. And then what happens next is a rebalance. And when you have a rebalance because of a consumer being unresponsive, it gets kicked out of the group. The topic partitions that that particular consumer in the group was responsible for are taken away and reassigned to the other active members of the group. In this case, it's very simple. We just had two consumers. So the one consumer that failed, it's going to get assigned the topic partition of the member that failed. Okay, so now let's move on to, uh, I'm going to introduce Kafka Streams. What is Kafka Streams? Uh, it's an application. It does not run inside the brokers. It's at the end of the day, you build a jar file and deploy it. Um, one of the configuration parameters is the uh, bootstrap URL for the broker or brokers. You can uh, so supply multiple. So it's going to connect, but embedded within a Kafka streams application, it has a consumer and a producer, but that's abstracted away. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, how many you have. But the key point is this is not running inside of a broker. It's external. And you can have uh, analogous to a consumer having a, a group ID. Uh, you can have multiple streams applications that have the same application ID. So if we went, if we were just thinking quickly about a topic with three partitions, if you spun up three Kafka Streams applications with the same app ID, then all three of those would be assigned one partition. It's a process. And so what this, what this does for us, this leads us to a unique feature. Um, usually when you're doing, a, when you have a, 
um, when you have a um, distributed system. To expand it, to add a node or take a node usually involves like stop. I mean, when you have a processing cluster, you have to stop it, add a node, or uh, to remove a node. With Kafka Streams, because under the covers it's using consumers, it relies on the consumer rebalance protocol. So again, with our simple example here, you have uh, a single app and there's three partitions. Uh, your the number of records, the volume of records increases and you want to improve your uh, processing, you need to ramp up. You just simply spin up two other applications. Rebounds occurs and then each application is going to be assigned a topic partition. And then the converse is true. Uh, processing slow, you don't need all these applications running. You would simply take down two of the app instances, shut them down gracefully, rebalance occurs again. And now you have a single app processing all three topic partitions. And one other unique thing about Kafka Streams is it allows for, uh, well, I, let me take a step back. So typically you have a processing cluster. You're ingesting records from Kafka and you're processing. You start pushing those results out to an external database. And naturally, you want to view those results. So you might have some sort of dashboard application that's going to repeatedly query that database and pull for update, you know, select updates that are happening on the, as a result of your processing. Kafka Streams has the notion of interactive queries that. Um, interactive queries, what that allows you to do, uh, Kafka Streams has um, stateful applications or stateful operations. And you can expose those, you can expose the, they're stored in the state store. By default, Kafka Streams uses RocksDB uh, for persistence. And you can expose that. We all, as Kafka Streams also has a memory stores, and those can be exposed for querying as well. But you can expose that store, and then you can query directly. So you can, as your stream, as your stream processing, as your event streams are doing their thing, you can query and get that state. So that kind of that changes the architecture needs a little bit of not having to have uh, an external data. Not not that it would completely replace an external database, but in some cases for a dashboard application, you don't need that other tier. You can just directly query of the state store of your streaming application. So now I'd like to cover um, Kafka Streams APIs. Uh, the first idea in the Kafka Streams API is that of a case stream. Case stream is an, un well, it's a stream. Kafka Streams deals with uh, event streams, so the records are always infinite. It's just a non-ending stream of records. And what we have is with the difference with the case stream, we consider it a record stream, is that even if you have, we've got three, we've got four records here, three of them have the same key. Those are considered unrelated in an event, in a record stream. Even though they have the same key, they're independent of each other. And that is the idea behind the case stream. But then we also had the, the uh, analog to that is an update stream, which is the K table. And in, with an update stream, the keys do matter. Later keys become updates for the previous record. So in this case, if you were to query for the latest record, you would get this one right here because it replaced the other one, each one that comes in replaces um, replaces the previous record with the same key. Now I'd like to show, I'd like to talk a little bit about the code of, of building a Kafka Streams application. But before we do that, I want to, this is going to be a very simple application. We're going to use, uh, I'm going to show you life before Kafka Streams. How would you do this with plain producers and consumers? And hopefully the point being showing you uh, 
how Kafka Streams makes things uh, a bit easier for you. So we're just gonna have a real simple uh, application as your main method. And we'll get to what these counter and send interval variables are for. But you're just gonna group, you're just gonna do count, you're gonna group by key and just do a simple count. So you create your consumer, you create a producer, and then you subscribe to your topics A and B. And then just basically, you're just off and running. You're gonna consume your records. And then as records come in, you just basically loop over uh, your hash map and then just increment the count per key. Pretty simple. But it's not really useful unless you share it with the outside world. So what you wanna do, and this is where our counter and send interval come in, is every so often uh, you want to share these, uh, you want to share these counts. So you're going to, when you hit the, when you hit the number of acquired records, or it could be by time, you're going to loop over your hash map and just create producer records uh, and then add the key and the value and then send that out. So this is how you would do that under, and I've left a few details out, configuration and other things, but that's how you would do this via um, Kafka streams. Now, how you would do this with Kafka Streams, the DSL, okay, this is the, an example of the DSL API. Uh, again, I've left out some details here, but you create a Stream Builder instance, and then you call Stream on it, and then you pass in a collection of topics. And this is your, this is analogous to the subscribe. Then you take that Stream and you just start doing it, you just start putting operations on it. You want to group by key, you want to count, and this materialized count store, this exposed, when I talk, spoke about interactive queries before, this exposes it by calling materialized, giving it a name. That's a signal that I want to expose this for query. Now count returns, I mentioned an update stream, count returns a K table, because every, every time you do a count, you're going to update the previous record. Now to send this back out, we want to turn this into event stream so we call two stream, and then you call two, which is the two operation, two method, and you just have your output topic there. So this is just, just nice, concise, uh, four or five lines of code, and then this is your, um, this is your uh, streams application. Now this is an example of the DSL. The DSL is, um, The DSL, it gives you the most flexibility. Uh, but if you need to deviate outside of the DSL, every, if you can do everything within the DSL, that's fine. But sometimes you have to go outside the DSL. So Kafka Streams offers the processor API. The trade-off with that being that with the DSL, you get maximum flexibility Programming wise, I mean, you saw it's just, it's a, you know, fluent interface, just with a few keystrokes, you can get a streaming application running. Uh, with the processor API, and all, I guess I should say the DSL does all the wiring up, because we'll talk about this in a second, but under the covers, Kafka Streams uh, generates a, uh, a DAG, a directed acyclic graph of processors. With the processor API, you've got maximum flexibility, you can do whatever you want but you have to do all the wiring. So here you create a topology object. Uh, and this is actually this word count processor demo is from Kafka Streams examples. Um, but you add a source. You're at it, so this is your source topic and you add a source. Next, you're gonna add a processor. And you always add, you, you use this with, um, you give it a name, give the processor a name, Processor supplier and the supplier should always return a new instance of the of the uh, processor implementation, and then you specify a parent. So basically, what this is saying is over here was the name of source source, but here you're saying it's its parent. So the importance of that relationship is everything that comes into the source node is going to get forward to the process node. And I've got a simple example here that only has one parent child, but you could have multiple children that 
source could have multiple children and it would just forward all the records to each processor that it's a child of. So next we're gonna add a state store. And here we're specifying in memory state store. But again, we're exposing it for queries by calling, by giving it the name counts. And we're saying here, it's not so much a parent-child relationship as we're giving the name or names, this is a var org uh, parameter, uh, name or names of store of processors that would have access to this store. And then finally, we add a sync, which is just writing the records out to an output topic. And again, we see the parent-child relationship. Here's the name of the parent or parents. Uh, a, a single processor node could have multiple parents that feed into it. Um, and that is, so you can see that's not too much extra code, but it, if you've got a lot of processing nodes, if you've got something more complicated, it can involve a lot because you're doing all the wiring yourself. But again, it gives you maximum flexibility. Now for the cat times that the DSL pretty much does say 90% of what you want, but you've got one thing you want. There's just not an operator. Uh, Kafka streams gives you the ability to um, mix the two, mix the two approaches. You can have a DSL, and then you can add a processor operation via um, one of the transform methods or process. So here we have, um, you know, we're doing our standard group by key count. Then once we call, we convert it back to a record stream. We're adding a transform on it. And this is the trans, uh, a transformer, uh, the transform interface has an init, a process, and a close method. And you, init is just where you would do any kind of setup work. Uh, but the process method is where you do whatever it is you want to do in that processor. And that's where the maximum flexibility comes in. You can just do whatever you need to in that processor. Um, an interesting use case for this uh, recently came about is Twitter uses um, Kafka streams for part of its, it's got a machine learning pipeline where it keeps track of user preferences and things for, I don't, don't remember all the details, but it's using Kafka streams to keep track of, uh, for the machine learning pipeline for user preferences. Uh, and to do with join, they had an instance where uh, the model data would come in, if I'm getting this correctly, certain data would come in and then tags would come in, but tags always lag, could lag behind. So they needed to be able to do a join, but have it wait. Do a join and then have it set it aside uh, to not forward it because you really don't want some of that user data to come in without a tag. So the solution was to integrate um, the streams DSL with the processor integration. And then within those transform methods, I think they use transform, uh, they built their custom, the operations around their state stores to do their custom behavior. Now, Kafka Streams offers, excuse me, offers stateless operations. Got the standard things you would expect, filter, map, uh, and map values. Um, map value, you'd use map values over map if you're not gonna change the key value pair, you're just gonna change the value. Uh, transform, and then Ktable has some methods as well, filter, group by, and map values. Now there's also stateful operations. Uh, we saw group by key count and before, but there's also a reduce in aggregate. And then you also have group by methods on a K table, which you would have to change the key because K tables by default have to have a key. But there's also stateful operations on uh, K table as well. Now, some of the more interesting uh, stateful operations. Uh, you can have a stream stream join. You've got two you've got two streams and it's pretty straightforward. You have you're calling left stream join on the right stream. You give a value joiner because they have to have the same key. So we don't worry about specifying the key. You have a, a value joiner, which is where what is the result of joining these two records together? It could be a, a brand new type. 
whatever. It's up to you what it does. And then you give it a join windows of 10 seconds. So what that, that well, let me, before I explain what join windows are, you could have an inner join, a left outer join, or just an outer join. An outer join, uh, if a record doesn't show up on either side within the given time of the join windows, it'll omit a record. Uh, inner join only emits if there's a match on both sides and left outer, as you expect, uh, if there's no match front on the right side, it admits the left side record. Uh, join windows of 10 seconds. What that means is kind of gives you a, if a record comes in either 10 seconds before or after that record. So that, that's your window of, of time. And you can actually even get more specific with um, join windows gives you a more specificity, more granularity with compared to um, how soon, how like how pre, like how early or how much after it can come. Then we have stream table joins. Um, pretty straightforward. And then here you don't give a join window. The stream table join is only triggered by the stream side. So if updates come to the uh, K table, it won't trigger, or it won't emit a result. It's the stream table joins are only, there's talk about changing this, but right now and Result is only triggered by a, a, something coming on the stream side. And then we've got a table table join. Now, within stateful operations, usually, you know, just getting a count, you want, just getting a, a plain count isn't always interesting. You want to know, like, time parameters. When did these things happen? Um, now, one thing I've mentioned timestamps before. Um, this time is, is essential to Kafka streams and for windowing, driving the events. So <clears throat> you set, you have a, you have a timestamp on your record when you produce it. Now you could have a different timestamp embedded in the value. Kafka streams provides a timestamp extractor. So if you want to use an embedded timestamp within the record you're sending, um, this is, you would use a timestamp extractor. Now the key thing is about timestamps is Kafka Streams is driven by the timestamps on the records, not wall clock time. So it's only moving and processing forward as long as the timestamps on the records are increasing. Um, and Kafka Streams has a notion of uh, stream time, which is the highest timestamp it's seen so far. Now for windowing, uh, we've got hopping windows uh, where you've got a window. You define a window size and how far, uh, and an advance time. So here we've got a minute window and it's going to advance by 30 seconds. Hopping windows give you um, will we'll give you overlapping results because here we see in our first window we've got all of these five results. It advances 30 seconds. Two of the results from the previous window are included, and so this. So you're going to have overlapping results. Uh, the other type of window we have are tumbling windows. Tumbling windows are just a special case of hopping windows where the window size, where the, where the slot, the advance time is the same as the window slide, uh, window size, excuse me. So you're not going to have um, overlapping records. Uh, so each, each window is going to have distinct records. Now there's a new type of window that is going to be coming out. It's not available right now. It's going to be coming out in 2.7. It's the notion of sliding windows. Now you could simulate this with hopping windows. Uh, let me back this up. Sliding windows by default advance one millisecond. Um, you could do this with hopping windows, but as I, you could see from the previous slide, you would end up with many, many windows with the exact same results and you'd be doing these calculations over and over and over again on the same results. Slotting windows guarantees you in each window, it's going to have a unique set of records. There might be records from the same window in there, but each window is going to be a unique set. So here, uh, record A comes in at time A, and that sets the, it comes in, it's got a time of 10. That sets the end window, every record that comes in, it's going to create a 
start a window. And then they're going to get combined as they go along. But A comes in and is the record. Now B comes in at 14 since you just def defined a time difference of 10 seconds. A is going to be included in that window now. And then the same thing when C comes in. It comes in at a time of 16. You've got 10 seconds, so it's going to pull in A and B. So you're going to have these distinct windows. And it keeps advancing, and then it gets to the point where we only have uh, the one record left in it. And then we have um, data-driven window. The other windows are driven by time. You have the data-driven window, which is session windows. A uh, session window is you to define an inactivity gap. And as long as records arrive within that inactivity gap, the window just keeps growing. So theoretically, your window could just keep growing forever and ever with session windows. Here, records uh, stop coming for a few, for a, a length of time greater than the uh, inactivity gap. So you end up with two windows. But down here at this bottom one, records keep coming in, so the window just keeps growing. Now, for stateful operation in Windows, you would like to have fault tolerance. The way Kafka Streams achieves this is you have a change log topic that backs a state store. Um, skipping over some finer details here, there's caching involved. But when records are written to the state store, those records are also written to the change log topic. And so that is your resilience for um, that state store. So if you were to, that instance were to migrate to another machine or you were to lose that machine, start up another one, the state store for that, and we'll cover tasks in a second, that would um, start reading, would read from the change log and restore the state to where it was from before. Now this is, and now this is the advantage of, again, I want to say if you're using RocksDB, if you're using persistent state stores, if you were to take a machine down and then bring it back up, it wouldn't. It doesn't need to recover because the state's permanent. In memory stores, you're always going to read from a change log. This is what the scenario here I'm showing is a fail failure scenario. Now, for um, if someone mentioned in the chat uh, checkpointing, what Kafka Streams has, which is kind of analogous to that, is this notion of standby tasks, and I'll talk about tasks in a second. But you have a task on machine A, and you've got machine B, and you've specified new configurations to use standby tasks. Well, what that is, that's a shadow task. It's not really going to be processing records, but as the task on machine A, as it writes to the store and it writes to the change log, the standby task is consuming and building up the state store. So if you were to have a failure scenario, the standby task on machine B, if you take machine A away, machine B, that standby task becomes the primary, but the state is already caught up. You don't have to do, or it would be a minimal amount of state to catch up from the change log time. I'm um, getting close on time, so I'll pick up the pace. Um, we had I had mentioned streams generating a graph. So this is our group by um, application that I had spoken about before, and it generates a graph like we see here. These are your two topics and these are this is the graph that is generated under the covers um, by this topology defined here now um, how are tasks assigned how are output how are top how are the partitions grouped up so basically when you have when you subscribe the multiple partitions multiple topics the number of tasks is the max of the number of impartitions across all the topics. So in this case, we've got topic A and topic B. A has four partitions, B has two. So then you're going to have four tasks. And a task is the lowest level, is the unit of work in a Kafka Streams application. So since we've got four tasks but six impartitions, how does the assignment work? How does data get parsed out? So uh, this first task is going to get, which is 0, 0, and the second number represents the partitions, is it's going to be assigned two partitions, both with the 0 partition, 0th partition of our topics. 
It's going to have two tasks. The second one is going to have two tasks of one. And then the second and the third and fourth task are only going to have one topic partition. Now that's a unit of work, but we need execution. So execution is determined by a concept of a stream thread. Uh, stream threads, you can have it's analogous to each stream thread is going to have an embedded consumer and an embedded producer. So each stream thread, in this case, we're going to have two stream threads. And this way, it's going to um, each have two tasks. So you could spin up up to four stream threads. And there, you, each stream thread would have one task. Uh, you could take this down to one thread, and then that thread is going to have four tasks. Uh, if you go above four threads, then you're going to have a thread that's idle. And this is the example here of you expand out to four threads and each thread has a task. Um, and that is uh, going to skip a review. I think I'm at time here. Um, so I want to thank you all for your time. And here's uh, some resource links. And there's a question there about how this compares to Flink. Um, well, they're both. Stream processing. Um, for late arrival, I think I covered window down under Dana. Did I cover window computations and joins enough for you? Um, records that are arriving late streams has a concept of a grace period. So when you define a window, I think I had it in one of my previous slides. When you define a window and the size of the window, you can define a grace period. So if you said my window, let's just take a tumbling window since that's the easier case. You've got a tumbling window of one minute. You could say I've got a tumbling window of one minute, but a grace period of um, 20 seconds. So that means if something shows up that is outside the time window, but within the grace period, it'll be included. And we consider that out of order data. Late arriving records are outside the window and outside the grace period, and those records are just dropped. Uh, and then checkpointing, like I said, we don't have specifically checkpointing. Um, I guess that's, I guess that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending the talk. Hope it was enjoyable. Um, feel, should I stick around and answer questions or just go ahead and just leave? Yeah, I guess that's it. There's no more questions. I'll go ahead and leave the session. Thanks again, everyone.